Uh, all right. Why don't we start off? This is Mr. Cecil Lewis. And why don't we start off? Why don't you talk to the students about these things you have right here? Maybe that would be a good way to start. Give you an idea of what soldiers face. This is a piece of rocket. This landed uh, uh, on the side of my chapel in Dong Ha, which is right up the DMZ, as far north as you can go without getting into trouble. This okay. is regular shrapnel from an artillery shell. Uh, I traveled to a place called J.J. Carroll across from the DMZ each Sunday and had a service in the afternoon. I'd get there a little early, so I'd take a nap or something in one of the empty bunks. So the siren came on because we were taking incoming. That's artillery was coming, hitting the camp. And so I got out of the tent, got down on the ground, so I made as least a target as I possibly could. When I got back, uh, it was all over. This little jewel was lying on the bunk where I'd been taking a nap, so I thank the Lord for that. It'll give you an idea. A piece that big could kill a man just very easily. My first week there, they called me in. A, a soldier had, had been killed, and they said the problem was when the, when the artillery started coming in, he got up and ran back because he had forgotten his rifle, of all things. And because he was standing up and running, this piece, small like that, uh, hit him in the vital organ and killed him. Uh, soldiers are trained to do things instinctively without even thinking. They're not supposed to think. They're supposed to do it because they're trained to do it. And um, unfortunately, uh, he's tried to think instead of reacting. Another soldier, uh, they were under attack at another place called a rock pile. And uh, he said, oh, I forgot my helmet. He got up and started running back to get his helmet and a rocket uh, of a piece like that hit him directly and killed him instantly. Now, was this a fellow that you knew or, or did you? I didn't know too many of them. There were so many out scattered around. And uh, uh, the place where this young fellow was killed, uh, I would visit, but I didn't spend time there. I was on a circuit from there. Can I you show us on the map where you, where you were? Yeah, I lived right up here. And I traveled clear down here to Chu Lai. That's Me Lai, where you probably heard where there were some atrocities there. I Can was in that them? same area. Were you there at the time? I was there at the time, yeah. Can you talk, some students know what you mean by Me Lai and some don't. Can you okay. talk about what that was? Uh, there was uh, a group of soldiers that were uh, going through this village and they started taking uh, fire from uh, the hooches, the uh, little houses there. And uh, so they started firing back and uh, I guess they just, they, uh, they just had taken too much of it so they dragged everybody out of their houses, put them in a ditch or an area there, and just massacred, I, I forget, 80 or 90 people, men, women, and children. Although most of them were women and children because the men were out gone. So the lieutenant that was in charge, uh, Callie was his name, Lieutenant Callie, uh, was found uh, guilty and he went to uh, prison following that, and uh, I heard stories about that. Uh, the chaplain who was the division chaplain at that time happened to also have a name of Lewis. He had been my instructor in chaplain school. He was a lieutenant colonel at that time, and I was the captain. And uh, uh, another good friend of mine was the chaplain where Callie was assigned and knew all those fellows, and he did report it properly, but it was uh, lost in the shuffle until it, it eventually came out. I think uh, uh, some news news people uh, 
uh, broke the story out, and, uh, that, and then they investigated and found it was true. Was that sort of thing, you know, there was this controversy related to Kerry and some of the things John Kerry not said true. when he came back? Well, not what true. Not true. What is it that you're a, saying isn't true? As a vet, I resent him, and I would no more vote for him because of what he said in 71 than I'd vote for, uh, well, anybody else. <laughs> uh, what, 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 I think what was that was deplorable. I was, I was sitting on the DMZ when Jane Fonda went through uh, North uh, Vietnam and made those Denver statements. Denver. What did she say? You know who Jane Fonda is? She went into North Korea, uh, North uh, Vietnam and played Patsy with them up there and talked about how terrible it was the way we were treating the people in South Vietnam. And uh, while she was doing that, uh, some of our people were prisoners and they were uh, maltreated as a result of that. And uh, uh, any soldier that was there at that time, I had, I can't use the language they used in describing her, and I wouldn't, but a, a lots of them said they'd never go to another movie that she made because of that. And. Uh, uh, what is it there that, just lots of bad feelings by soldiers because she had gone there and done that. What is it that Kerry said? Is there any, anything? He said that we them? were all guilty of atrocities in Vietnam and that uh, we were baby killers, etc., etc. And uh, maybe, maybe that was guilty. He was guilty of that. But in the area where I was, up clear up in the DMZ, that sort of thing didn't happen. We were not faced with uh, Viet Cong. We were faced with NVA. We were surrounded with them all. That's uh, North Vietnamese regular soldiers. Let's back up a little bit. Um, how old were you? Now, you were in the Army? I was in the Army. Chaplain uh, in the Army? Did you go chaplain. in as a chaplain? I went in as a chaplain. Did you, you join the army with the intention of becoming a chaplain, or you joined the army no, and then was, became a chaplain? I was a pastor in a Baptist church in Flint, Michigan, and I kept praying every Sunday morning that the Lord would send good chaplains to Vietnam to preach the gospel. And uh, I got a letter saying we knew you were interested in the army as a chaplain during the Korean War, which is true. I didn't have seminary back then, and uh, so family, our whole family sat down and discussed it and prayed about it. I even had them vote yes or no whether they thought we ought to join the Army, because they knew I would be going to Vietnam. What was the vote? Four to nothing. They all felt that that's what the Lord wanted us to do. So you wanted to be a chaplain in the Korean War? Yes, I applied then, but they said, sorry, you don't have seminary. You have to have regular college, the equivalent of seminary degree, and um, many denominations require at least two years experience in the civilian pastor before you go in. Before now, you what year was this that you made the decision to go in? That was 1966. And why did you think the Army needed chaplains? Or why did you think the guys in Vietnam needed chaplains? Well, uh, the, the war was ongoing in, in the six, started in 61 when we were sending uh, advisors in. And it just kept getting worse and worse and we kept hearing stories and watching the news. And by 66, it was clear that we had a large contingent of soldiers sailors there, there. Um, When you went in in 66, what was the feeling in the country? Had, by that time, were the demonstrations against the war already going, or would those come later? Um, no, they were, they were going on. I, I remember coming back in, in 67, and they advised us not to wear our uniforms in public. Why not? Because of the the bitterness and the division about the war. Um, but you know, uh, while I was there in 67, 
I was with a group of chaplains that had a meeting, and a local farmer came to that meeting, and he said, I just wanted to, to bring word from all my neighbors and the people in our community. He said, since you've been here, this is the first year that we've been able to uh, harvest our own rice crop without having it stolen by the communists coming down from North Vietnam. And he thanked us for it. And that was early on when you got there? That was 1967, the spring of 67. So you joined in 66, and then where did you go for training? To Fort Hamilton and Fort Dix in New Jersey. <coughs> How long did you remain stateside before you went in the country? Six months. I went in in October and went to Fort Knox in December and to Vietnam in uh, September. And did you know from the outset that you were going to Vietnam? Oh, yes. I know. That was understood. That there was, was no chance that you go to Germany. Waited for a phone call from the bosses there at your post that you were going. So, so when the phone call came and you realized, what, how much time did you have between the phone call coming and actually getting on the plane? Uh, you can take uh, a week or two of uh, leave so you can move your family and get everything situated before you. They tried to get 30 days notice, but you didn't often get it back in those days because it, it was moving so fast and they needed people so much. How, how much time did you have <coughs> between that phone call and actually getting on the plane to go? Oh, let's see. I had probably three weeks before I had to to leave for California. And your wife knew that this phone call was going to come eventually yeah. anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, you went home and told the family my husband said, well, we're moving. <laughs> the first, first nine years in the Army, we moved eight times. Because the, you have to, we were in Fort Knox. We moved to Fort Knox from the church in uh, Flint, Michigan. Then we moved to Ohio, which uh, was our home in near Dayton, Ohio. And then I went to Vietnam, came back at the end of the year, and we moved again. So that one year tour really uh, moved everything. You had lots of moves then. So the one year rotation that American combat soldiers were involved in also applied to chapters you're in for a year around. Did the, was the U.S. military losing many chaplains in the war? Uh, yes, I don't know exactly how many. We had a good friend who lived just down the street, Phil Nichols. And uh, in fact, our uh, daughter's baby sat for him. And uh, Phil was in the, some of the same areas that I was in. And uh, unfortunately, he uh, tripped over a trip line and uh, a big bomb that they had rigged up exploded and killed him and several other soldiers. How old was he? He was uh, in his late, I'd say 28 to 30. He was a chaplain. He was a chaplain, had two young children. And we had uh, several that, that were killed. What were your conversations like in those three weeks between getting the phone call and going in the country? Well, I guess oh, your what, are you talk about? <laughs> what are you talking about? My <laughs> wife's in the back there. What Probably you Mayflower. <laughs> <laughs> we I mean, were busy. Did you, did you we talk were... about a will, put together a will? And oh, yeah. The, uh, you go through a process. Uh, the military is very good about uh, seeing that you have a will power of attorney, and all those sort of uh, legal documents, really. <coughs> all of these soldiers that are in Iraq have already done that. And they have uh, a process where families are, they keep in touch with the families and assist them in every way they can. Uh, Mrs. Lewis, you, what was your, um, what was your last minute together like before you had to say goodbye? It was rough. Well, pretty, pretty quiet. What happened? Nothing. We just both had to really try hard not to let our emotions fall out. 
And what happened when he turned around and walked up? It was hard. Mm -hmm. How long was it until you heard from Oh, he's a good writer. He wrote almost every day. So I heard <laughs> when I so when the mail got through, I would hear from him. And, and likewise, I was an everyday writer. We got right. boxes of letters at home that we nobody will want. <laughs> we'll have to open one of these days. I thought we'd do it on our 50th anniversary, but we, oh. we were too busy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a teacher's assistant who'd love to photocopy. For me, I like to read them myself. It's probably too personal. Uh, but um, mail calls important, isn't it? Yes. Uh -huh. How often did you get it? Well, um, The area, I lived in the battalion area, which was the headquarters for about a thousand of us. Uh, and then the rest of them were spread around different areas. So since I lived near the headquarters, they would bring the mail over to my office and leave it there or give it to me. They were very good to me. Did you ever have a mail call when you didn't get anything or did you always get Oh yeah, there were days when you wouldn't get anything and then you'd get three or four letters all at once. I'm sure that's just the way it still is. Um, when did you, uh, you see so you arrive in the country in '67? Yeah, in '66. '66. No, '67. Right. Yeah. What was your first impression when you got off the plane? Uh, it was hot and humid. It was in the middle of the night. It was dark. It was scary. It, how was it scary? Just on uh, the unknown? Or? Well, they had you as we were coming in to land. Where did you land, by the way? Just the landing strip uh, up there somewhere? We landed right here, Benoit. And so, how did you get all the way up there? This truck? No, no, an airplane. Oh, C 130. So when you first that, was an in, that was an interesting trip. Um, the captain saw me standing there with my bag. He said, uh, would you like to come on up the cockpit with us? I said, sure. So I went up there and sat on the jump seat. I could see everything then. That was very comfortable. About halfway up, there's a place called Quignon. And um, they started talking to each other. I didn't have headset on, so I couldn't hear what they're saying. But then one of them reached over, and I wondered what was going on. And then we got over the airfield and they started circling. And I thought, uh oh, something's wrong. And so then they got real low and came around by the control tower. And I found out later that the light wasn't working that showed that the, that the landing gear had lowered properly. And that's what they were checking. They told them the gears were down, go ahead and land. And so they fixed that, and then we went on up country. <coughs> you could always tell how long the pilot of the plane had been in country by the way they flew. Uh, it was very interesting. They had some old guys like uh, Lieutenant Colonels flying those C-130s, which was unusual because most of them were young captains. But the guys that had been in country for just a short time would make uh, uh, a different kind of approach when they were landing. And, uh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's a computer. I don't know. <laughs> they, they would make a combat landing, they called it. They would come in and then drop right down into it. The other guys that had been in country a long while, they knew what was going on, they'd just come in regular. But it was dangerous. We had one C-30 with over 50 soldiers that was shot down and everybody was killed. So it was dangerous wherever you were and whenever you were. When did you, um, so you got there and you said, I, was it summer when you got there or spring? Uh, yes, it was still, it was in uh, September. So it was still, still warm. Still yeah. hot. Yeah. And uh, how long were you there before you were in your first um, when combat got close, meaning 
you were talking to somebody who had been wounded or you actually found yourself near a combat situation? The first week I was there, uh, they called me over to, uh, uh, we had a battalion uh, naval hospital there actually driven by the Marines. And that was uh, my first experience seeing one of our soldiers had been killed. He had been hit by just a small piece of uh, uh, artillery shell and it just hit the wrong place and killed him. This uh, was the first, the first, that was the first week I was there. The first KIA that you saw. Yeah. On and there. my first Sunday there, uh, about halfway through my sermon, the siren went off and uh, artillery started falling all around us. So I said, all right, that's all, let's pray and go. <laughs> we cut it off and everybody had to head to the bunkers. Then. How old was this fellow you saw who was dead? He was uh, probably 19, 21 at the oldest. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Go ahead, Kill. What was your endorsement? I was in, uh, endorsed by the General Association of Regular Baptists, G-A-R-B, Garbage Baptists. <laughs> and, what was and what was your unit? What unit were you? I was with the 1st Battalion, 44th Artillery. We had uh, what they called dusters. And people call them tanks, but they weren't tanks. They were anti-aircraft, two 40 millimeters uh, and of course they're too old, they don't use them anymore. But that's what we had. And the quad 50s, they had uh, four 50 caliber machine guns mounted on the back of a five ton truck. And uh, since they didn't have airplanes coming in at us, they just used them for all sorts of things. We protected the Marines up on the DMZ because the Marines uh, engineer group there had the responsibility to go out every morning at dawn and check because there would be uh, uh, bombs and that sort of thing placed in the dirt roads to explode. So we would have to go out and clean the roads before they could uh, send a convoy anywhere. And our fellows would go out about 5 and 5.30 in the morning and would uh, provide protection for the Marine engineers. In the combat zone, did denominational differences not mean very much to sort of Protestant Catholic? No, Protestant Catholic. I had one young guy come <coughs> to me and asked me if I had a cross. I said, oh yeah, I got one. I carry it in my pocket. So I gave it to him. I looked and he had a Star of David on. I said, well, you got a Star of David. He said, sir, I'm covering all the way in the light. <laughs> so. Was that, I've heard stories of this. Is this true? Did a lot of Vietnam oh, soldiers yeah. do this? Or yeah. Do left terms? And lots of them carried the testament in the pocket because they had heard that people had shot yeah. them and, yeah. and saved by Yeah, that testament. goes back at least to the Civil War, maybe before. And it's, I'm sure it happened sometimes. Rob had a question, then Debbie had a question. Go ahead, Rob. Um, I was wondering, how did the soldiers in general view you um, and your cause of being over there? Um, and the reasons you were there, did they? We were highly respected. Uh, we were considered very powerful by most of the soldiers. Why? How so? Because we could go in to talk to any of the commanders, say anything we wanted, do whatever we wanted in their behalf, and they knew that. If, uh, if they had a problem from home and they needed some assistance some way, they could come to us and we could make connections through Red Cross to get help for them. All sorts of ways that we help soldiers. Debbie? I was wondering, do you remember any uh, things that you did while you were in Vietnam that maybe you still do today, like uh, something you did to help you relax while you were out there? or? Did you pick like any like coping habits yeah. or just did you pick up any any habits or ways of dealing with stress in Vietnam that you still you stick with to this day? Uh, the longer you were in combat, the easier it was in some ways because you knew what to expect, and that was also a problem 
because lots of fellows got careless after they'd been there for a while. And uh, we, we had like one fellow was killed the last night he was in the country. He was going home the next day. He was killed. Well, he just thought his time's up and I mean, I'm, I'm done so I don't have to worry anymore. Well, uh, he was out on a mission and um, just happened to uh, Lots of the other, his friends were uh, extremely angry over it because they thought he shouldn't have been put out on a mission the night before he was to go home. And I agree with that. He shouldn't have been. He should have stayed in. But uh, he was sent out with his group. We had another poor fellow who was a gunner on the, the quad 50s. And I mean, those, those were powerful. They had armor-piercing uh, uh, projectiles they could use. But one poor fellow was was manning the 50 calibers and an RPG. You've heard of RPGs, I imagine, because they're still using them in Iraq. It's a rocket-propelled grenade. And an RPG came through and hit both his arms. And when they brought him in, they were just barely hanging on you know, his side, which meant he was going to lose both arms. Lots of tragic things happened. How do you deal with that from day to day? I had one interesting uh, experience. Uh, dur during the holiday, I forget now how they call it now, uh, we had so many casualties that they had to go into the offices and get the guys that ran typewriters and all to fill uh, the ranks because there were so many that were wounded. So the colonel and I went to see uh, a whole group that had been brought in that had been ambushed. So we'd lean over and talk with them and I'd have a word of prayer with them. Well, one of them, a sergeant who had been shot in the back, and that was the way that they, uh, those communists did from North Vietnam. They'd wait until we pass, and then they'd shoot our guys in the back. But this one guy was shot in the back. When he came back uh, from the hospital, he, he was telling everybody, you know, the chaplain was the only one that came to see me when I got hit. Well, the colonel was with me, but he didn't see him. He saw my cross and heard my prayer, I guess, and that's what he appreciated. Any other questions? Gotcha. Something that some of us have uh, maybe noticed from the veterans that we've been listening to, the Vietnam veterans tend to have a very good understanding of the sort of big picture of what was going on in Vietnam, the climate, uh, but not so much an identity with the specific jobs that they did. A lot of them have a hard time really talking about their jobs from day to day, as opposed to the World War II veterans who can, you know, tell you exactly what they did from day to day, but they really don't seem to have any understanding of the big, the war as a big picture. I was wondering if you uh, sort of might have noticed or you might remember uh, people not having a real connection with their job and just sort of been floating around a little bit. Does that make any sense to you? Uh, I think for the most part, uh, they don't want to talk about many of the things that they saw and experienced. That's, that's a larger part. When, you, uh, when you're with other guys that have been through the same thing, you'll hear them talking about their stories, but they won't talk about them with other people. And I think that's just a very common occurrence. Why, why is that? Uh, like, like the bumper sticker said, uh, if you didn't go, you, do, you don't know. And that's it, the lack of really understanding how terrifying it is. Uh, there was a river that they used to get non-potable uh, non water, which they couldn't drink, but they used for different uh, things. And they would back the buffalo, that we call it. It was a big tank on wheels attached to a deuce and a half. They would just back that into the river and uh, wait and the water would just flood in there until it was full and then they'd pull out of the river and take it back to the base. 
But this one day, one time, uh, rainy during the rainy season, the current was too strip, swift, and they couldn't handle the truck or the buffalo, and w one of the fellows uh, fell off. His buddy that was with him jumped in after him to try to rescue him, forgot or didn't realize he did not swim himself, and they were both lost. Lots of strange things happen, and, and they happen, I'm sure they're happening in Iraq the same way, and uh, maybe a little different uh, uh, scenario, and maybe the different climate, but much the same thing when people are in trouble. Their soldier friends come to their uh, their help and will do anything to help them. A strong bond in combat. Yeah, yeah. yeah I have something to go along with that. I, I was wondering, you know, with, with so many soldiers seeing so much death and so much tragedy, I'm, I'm sure you got a lot of questions as to why and, you know, why would God allow this or why is there war? Was that, first of all, was that tough to deal with? Well, I'm sure, I'm sure it was, but how did you deal with those questions? And second, how did you answer those questions? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't remember hearing the soldier ask those kind of questions. You, so you don't, you don't have a recollection of a soldier ever saying, you know, chaplain, why is God, why is God letting this happen? Yeah, no. You don't ever remember that. Story. Did the thought ever go through your own mind? No. I understood, I understood that. Uh, there's evil in the world, and we've got to deal with it one way or another. A, a related question. There's this, uh, one of the questions that class has been, uh, or has thought about recently is um, this idea that there are no atheists in foxholes. That in combat, you know, combat forces men to think about eternity and think about God and so on. <coughs> Do you think that's true based on your experience? Well, I was uh, in case on while they were in under siege, which means they were all they were surrounded, and uh, the Marines and the Army dug trenches around the whole area, so so they'd be safer. And they slept in the ditches and in the mud. And uh, I walked around there, and uh, I had obtained. Uh, New Testaments, Gideon New Testaments. Thank the Lord for the Gideons. I had a friend who was a Gideon, and uh, he told me before I left, he said, anytime I can do anything to help you, let me know. So I wrote him, and I said, I can use some New Testaments to hand out to soldiers. And I said, send as many as you can. He sent me 10,000 <laughs> Gideon New Testaments uh, for soldiers. They had their own uh, addition. So I started handing those out. I'd carry them with me in my bag as I traveled. And when I'd have a service, I'd put a stack of them up in front and I'd say, now come get one of that. They have songs in the back, the words to hymns. Incidentally, what do you think the two favorite requests were that I got to sing? By the soldiers. You want to guess Onward anybody? Christian soldiers. <laughs> Onward Christian soldiers. That's that's one of them. Onward Christian soldiers. I was out in the middle of nowhere, and we were singing Onward Christian soldiers because that's what they wanted to sing, and I you could hear a, a firefight off in the distance, but you could tell the difference between an AK-47 and an M16, and you could tell them. You could hear them going back and forth. Kind of a strange. The other one you probably would never guess, just as I am. Lots of times they'd ask to sing just as I am. So I'd go out, travel around, hitch rides and helicopters. They'd take me out to these little gun positions and we'd have a service. They'd all gather around. A few of them would sit on the perimeter, kind of guard the area, while I had service with the rest of them. So, based on your experience, would you say that the average soldier, you know, thought about faith and yes, they prayed? Did. 
I never had one of them say anything negative about when I'd ask them if they'd like for me to have prayer with them. They were eager to hear. Sometimes they felt that they had so much weight they had to carry that they would not take a testament, but that was up to them because they had to carry a lot when they were out in the field. Did you have many who converted in the field? They wanted to My second tour, I was there twice. The second time I was down there in Benoit, not far from Saigon, <coughs> right here, Benoit. And it was a it was what they call the reception center. And that's where all the new soldiers came in and they would receive their assignments and uniforms and anything else they needed and then they'd send them out to their unit. Well, uh, on, we had a chapel there, and on Sunday they'd all come to church. I had a, a warrant officer who was a fine Christian man, <clears throat> Southern Baptist, and on Sunday morning I'd preach a gospel message, and I'd give the invitation. I'd say, if, if you've never asked the Lord to forgive you your sins, you want to do that, raise your hand. And every Sunday there were some that did that. I'd say, now if you really mean business, stand up wherever you are. And they'd stand up. I'd say, now, now, I want you to go to the center aisle, to the back of the chapel, and there's a man waiting for you back there. And he's going to take you into a room and talk to you and answer any questions. And he would take them through the plan of salvation, answer all their questions and all while I was greeting people that uh, left. <coughs> so you did see some of those. Okay, Kelly? What? Your first two are there. What, what type of, because uh, you were so far in work, can you describe to us the, one, the facilities that you had available, and as, as far as like field, um, field services also, what you would have with Army Supply View, and maybe a little bit about your chaplain's assistant. Okay, I had a and vehicles or anything like that. Yeah, I had a jeep way. assigned to me that I used some, but most of the time I'd catch rides in helicopters, and I would carry mail. So they always gave me priority because I was carrying mail to soldiers as well as being a chaplain. And uh, uh, did any of the helicopters you own ever come under fire? Yes. Everybody got under fire. <laughs> uh, they had built a chapel when I got there. When I, a group had had uh, gone over on ships originally, and I was the second chaplain assigned there. The second group, of course, I was flown over, and then. Uh, replaced the first chaplain. Uh, and after I got there, the colonel looked at the little room at the back of the chapel that was dirty, filthy. And he said, oh, he says, this won't do. And he had him build me a, we call it a hooch, small um, place. And it was about half the size of this room. Pretty good size, nice room with had, uh, doors, windows <laughs> and it had uh, uh, sandbag place where I could go when artillery was coming in. Um, you said the first time you wanted you wanted to go to Vietnam, you signed up because that's what you wanted to do. You came back to the States in 67 or 68? I came back in 68 to Fort Place, Texas and volunteered to return to Vietnam in 1970. So you came back, I guess the Tet Offensive took place before you came back? Yes. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then you're back here for a year, and then you wanted to go back to Vietnam, yeah. despite everything that you'd seen. Yeah. Why did you want to go back? Well, I knew I was going to be moved somewhere, and uh, it was either Korea or Vietnam as far as I could tell. And I figured well, I'd rather go back to Vietnam where the ministry is so rich and where so people really listen to you. Yeah. And, uh, 
Any other questions? Go ahead, Jim. Um, you said a little while ago that um, uh, you, you knew that there was a sense, there was evil in the world, and you knew that you had you know, it was your job to your responsibility to fight it. Um, a lot of us though are too young to really remember the climate of the Cold War communism. Can you uh, explain a little bit of the evil, you know, of communism, what that was, and why it had to be stopped? Uh, it was pervasive. Uh, you can you can imagine how uh, uh, emotional the election is here now. That that's the feeling we had about communism and uh, what he was doing. Uh, Khrushchev came back to the states, to the United Nations, and he made statements like. Your children will live under communism. And uh, there was uh, just a uh, widespread fear of what was going to take place and uh, what had to be done to stop it from spreading. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, did you ever see any Vietnamese killed in action? Oh, yes. Yeah. Be willing to talk about, I mean, an experience. Uh, do you remember a place, a time, an event when you saw that? Well, right there at Dong Ha, where I live, we had, as I said, a, a Navy naval uh, battalion station, just a small place. But they did have a surgeon and a couple of doctors there, and um, they they took care of North Vietnamese soldiers that were wounded and captured, the same as ours. I heard some comments by some of our fellows that didn't like that, but uh, that was the general policy to take care of them as well as they took care of us. They, they didn't like that because they knew that if an American was captured that he wouldn't be treated. Okay. So, yeah. I had, I had a first aid kit that was captured uh, uh, from a North Vietnamese soldier. And I brought it back and asked the uh, medical people what, what was in there. And they said, it's just aspirin. That's all that's in there, Chaplain. So you um, you saw some North Vietnamese dead then and wounded. Yeah. Would you try to minister to them through a translator? No, we didn't. Have, I didn't have that, that uh, opportunity. Do you remember what you thought or what you felt when you saw? I guess you know what I'm looking for is, you know, you mentioned this uh, um, this fellow Phil Nichols, and then the other young young man you saw in your first week there, and um, now Phil was a friend of yours, but this other young man that you mentioned wasn't. He was just a young kid that you saw who was dead there, and you probably had a feeling about that when you saw that. And then you probably had some kind of feeling or some sort of thought when you saw the dead Vietnamese soldier. Were they the same feelings or were they different or do you just shut down and you don't really have any feelings or? You get so you don't have any feelings. Yes. Uh, I served as chaplain in the fire department and the police department here in Siloam since 1997. And uh, I found that that experience in Vietnam and seeing so much uh, there made it much easier working with uh, the firemen as they extracted somebody from a serious accident or uh, people who committed suicide and things like that. I hate, I hate to say that you get tough to those things, but you, you kind of get accustomed to it. And so did our soldiers. Well, was, uh, in, in your in your view, um, how did the average soldier in Vietnam see the enemy? Did the average soldier see the enemy as just a guy who's fighting for his country the way I'm fighting for mine? Or what was the perception of the enemy out there? Well, I can tell you <laughs> what a friend of mine, a company, a battery commander, did. Uh, when it, in May of 60 and 68, after Tet, 
he had a sign painted in his battery area, and it said, uh, Kill a Kong for Mom, or something like that. Uh, they saw so many of their buddies get hurt that they had very strong negative feelings about uh, the enemy and what they were doing and how they were doing it. Did the protests that were taking place back home make it worse? The what? Did the protests that were taking place on the home front make it worse for the guys in country? Um, they didn't. They didn't like it, of course, and they um, had their own description of people that did that and all, but they understood it. Yeah. The ones I was with, at least, did. Okay, Kelly. Two questions. Um, one. How did they, uh, was it hard to distinguish enemy from the yeah. civilian form? I mean, I know we hear a lot about it, but I mean, firsthand, what was that like for them? I mean, were guys more hesitant at first when they got in country and less hesitant later, or? Right, yeah. The guys that had been there some time taught the new newbies, and they kind of, influenced then, I'm, I'm sure. The word among lots of them uh, was uh, you shoot them all and sort them out later. Uh, it, combat is a savage thing. and uh, uh, I think the reason there was so much opposition to the Vietnam War is because there was so much publicity you had so many uh, TV pictures going on. And what, what really happened when there, was, uh, when there was action in one particular small area, all these photographers would flock to that area and get those pictures and send them back. Uh, the other areas could be very peaceful and there would be no problem but there would be one area where they were really having a bad time, and that's what always got reported back in the United States. And uh, that, would, that was the bad part of the media coverage of Vietnam. How was how how in-country, like Armed Forces Radio, how did that influence the guys? Or was it available to them, or did that? Uh, when you were near Saigon and big places like that, they, I'm sure they listened to it, but up out in the field, they didn't have any radio. Or I, I served in, in also, and was in Korea for 18 months, and I know that's a big, big thing yeah. for them. And they play a lot of music that really gets them psyched up yeah. to, you know, to, to do their job, you know, to be ready to kill or to do whatever they, you yeah. know, that mentality. And I didn't know if that actually took place then or not. Yeah, I, I was in Korea. I was the division chaplain and was an honorary member of the group that's on the DMZ, or used to be on the DMZ. I understand they pulled them back now. Wow, oh, this is just what it says. Uh, They're still there at Longest. Are they? Yes. Any other questions? Um, you mentioned Phil Nichols, a uh, uh, fellow you know who didn't come back. He's tripped over wires uh, <coughs> as to a, a mine. Um, anyone else you know who didn't come back? Not personally. He's, Phil's the only one that I really knew uh, from being with him before I went to Vietnam. Did you have to write letters to parents? No. Uh, who would do that? There were the adjutant general of each unit would sit down with uh, his commander, his company commander or battery commander, and they would they would uh, uh, send a letter. But it had to be uh, processed through the proper channels before it could be mailed. And last question: um, If there's one thing that you want young people to know about Vietnam, what would it be? I think I think the soldiers that were there, for the most part, 
at least the part uh, up country away from Saigon, felt that it was worthwhile. The guys I was with felt it was worthwhile. Uh, but when you get down to Saigon and the big cities and things like that, uh, they didn't have enough to do and they had a different attitude about it. Goodness in Saigon, you get pizza and all kinds of American food and, um, and the like. Up where we were, and out, out in the field, you, you ate uh, rations, you know, regular army rations. You carried them with you. So it depends on, when I see somebody that tells me they were from Vietnam, the well, first thing I ask them is, where were you stationed? And I can tell you then what their life was like. But it makes a difference. All right, well, thank you very much.